there's a style of tectonics that's largely hidden to us, submerged on the edges of some of the world's continental margins, but evidenced by seabeds that look like crumpled blankets. Seismic profiling reveals the structure, bulldozed piles of sediments scraped off the seabed. I'm Rob Butler and I'm going to explore these structures, nature's tectonic snowplows. Let's take a tour into an example, starting in the middle of the Atlantic, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. This is where new oceanic crust is formed. This young crustal surface, largely submarine lava flows, is rough. But as we trace this away from the ridge, the seafloor becomes smoother, buried under layers of sediment. But all changes as we approach the island of Barbados. The seabed looks to be rucked up. Let's interpret this scene. Over in the east, the carpet of sediment is smooth, undeformed. But there's a distinct break. The seabed rises up to the island of Barbados and is highly crumpled. The sediments of the seabed here have been deformed and piled up. So what's the tectonic setting? We're at a convergent plate boundary with these islands of the Caribbean forming a chain of volcanoes. The edge of the crumpled seabed is an oceanic trench and these are the sedimentary basins around the arc. The setting has all the classic components of a zone of plate convergence. Subduction and its associated arc volcanism with adjacent sedimentary basins. And there, at the trench, a stack of deformed sediments, an accretionary prism. Let's take a closer look. Check out this seismic profile. The rough oceanic crust with its carpet of sediments and an important boundary between undeformed strata below and stacked up strata on top. This is called an accretionary prism. But this profile is a little misleading. It's stretched vertically, so this is a more accurate representation. The prism is a highly tapered wedge. One of the most studied examples of this type of tectonics is here, off southern Japan. This is the Nankai Trough, where seismic profiling and scientific drilling has provided clues about the geological processes that form these structures. Like for Barbados, here's the oceanic crust, a tract of sediments coming in, being restacked at the trench. This is called frontal accretion. You can see it in other seismic images, thrust stacking at the toe of the slope, the front of the accreting wedge. But there's more going on here. Another thrust fault apparently breaking off a bump on the top of the oceanic crust, termed by the Nankai researchers as the mega splay thrust. On a rare 3D seismic image, this thrust has been imaged more clearly, breaking the seabed, apparently having triggered slumps. So, nature's tectonic snowpow can make for some complex structures. I've come to snowy Finland to see what insights we can gain from actual snow ploughing. The blanket of snow serves as our sediment, carpeting the roadway below. So we create the components we've seen in the geological world. So let's look at the snow stacking. Firstly, we can identify frontal accretion. But also thrusts that cut up into the accretionary prism, so-called out-of-sequence thrusting.
we've made a mega splay thrust. So stacking snow, stacking strata to make accretionary prisms involves complex thrust activity, sometimes frontal accretion and sometimes out of sequence thrusting, the mega splay thrusts. The notion that accretionary prisms are dynamic like this was predicted back in the 1980s by considering them not as snow, but as made of much simpler material, unconsolidated sand, so-called Coulomb materials, where strength is all about friction. Davis and others developed an idea of a critical wedge, the shape of our prism defined by a surface slope and a basal slope. The wedge shape reflects a dynamic balance between the frictional resistance to sliding at the base against the strength of the wedge sediments, their so-called internal angle of friction. You might know of this idea in the notion of the angle of repose of unconsolidated rocks on hillsides, for example. So the wedge shape in accreting prism has these controls. Frontal accretion builds the toe of the accreting prism, but sporadic out-of-sequence thrusting maintains the overall wedge shape. And of course, if the deep detachment encounters bumps and so forth, the overriding wedge must respond too. The Coulomb setup has been taken into scaled experiments, sandbox models, such as this one by Nina Kukowski and colleagues. They use sediment for the wedge and glass beads for the basal detachment fault so that it was slippery. Then let the system develop. And this sequence of images is the evolution of the structure in steps. The frontal accretion is obvious. But to maintain the wedge shape at depth, there's more stacking, creating a so-called basal duplex. Like the out-of-sequence thrusting, this duplex elevates the middle part of the prison, maintaining the wedge taper. Consider the early and late stages of this model. They have the same taper. It's called a critical wedge. And these tapers are different if the properties of the basal detachment change. In this case, it's dip. So the shapes of accreting prisms are a dynamic balance. We can summarize the structural elements in accretionary prisms based on theory and scaled experimental simulations. So that's how a critical wedge works. Some of these structures we've seen in seismic images already. But can we see deeper those basal duplexes? The challenge is that seismic imaging in these regions is generally very poor. Let's leave the Nankai behind and move across the Pacific. This is the subduction system of Cascadia and a series of scientific cruises with seismic acquisition have been revealing the structure. This early image has been tied to determinations of seismic velocities. Reds and oranges imply that the strata are poor transmitters of seismic energy, slow velocities, reflecting poorly consolidated sediments. The blues are oceanic crust. So, as sediment compacts due to the mass of strata on top, their seismic velocities increase. So, going into the accretionary prism, the velocities increase too. And, zooming into the seismic image, the structure is complex. So, let's look at more recent efforts to image the structure. Thrust faults inclined out towards the ocean. Back thrusts. So, let's follow Han et al's approach, stretching the image and adding a more detailed version of the seismic velocity structure just for the sediments. The velocity increases down, implying greater compaction, certainly compared with the underformed strata ahead of the prism. It takes more than two kilometers burial for the strata ahead of the prism to compact to have seismic velocities of approaching 3.5 kilometers a second. This is burial compaction. But in contrast, in the prism, at the same burial depths, 
the strata have seismic velocities heading towards 4 kilometers a second. There's extra compaction. The rocks have been squeezed by tectonics. So given the heterogeneity in seismic velocities, it's no wonder that the seismic imaging is tough. It's not just the structure of the beds that's complex, but so is the seismic velocity structure. The internal structure of cretary prisms in the natural world remains significantly uncertain. And this is a big deal, because these regions of uncertainty are approaching the places that nucleate huge earthquakes. We need better images to understand how and where these earthquakes form, and to understand the risks they represent. But there's still lots we do know, and can understand, about accretionary prisons. These are dynamic wedges. The critical wedge theory says that the shape of the prism is tuned by the activity of the internal structures, those thrust faults. But the internal structure becomes increasingly opaque the further down we look. Given this uncertainty, it's not surprising there's lots of active research going on. So watch out for great further advances in understanding the structure of accretionary prisms. I've been Rob Butler. Thank you for watching this short video.